Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this July 29th, 2015 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony, and you're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. And uh, you can catch my show, uh, literally, you can listen to it. You can catch it, uh, if you have a big baseball glove, at 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's every evening on FirstAmendmentRadio.com, Pacific Time, Monday through Friday. This is Part 12 of In Search of a Great Ice Wall. And uh, I'm not inside my big freezer, walk-in freezer, looking for ice on the sides of my walk-in freezer. But I'm uh, searching for that ice wall that surrounds the entire world. And in this Circle Earth model that I'm talking about, the South Pole does not exist as we've been told. That is a good possibility. Now, Greg, you haven't gone off your rocker, or maybe you have. Well, I'm not on my rocker right now. My rocker's right behind me. As you get older, you get a rocking chair. But now I've got a recliner. I figure I should be able to have at least a recliner. Have you seen the airplane that Donald Trump travels around in? He's talking about wanting to be president of the world and dictator of America. And he has a new 757 airplane with his name on it, of course, Trump. And when you get inside of it, it's got gold-plated, uh, uh, gold pl- everything on it's gold-plated, including the seat belts. And that'll just tell you what he travels in. But he goes around saying... Oh, I want to make America a better place. Well, Donald, you know, if you want to make America a better place, why don't you go around the country in a horse and buggy? Uh, And then I'll believe you. It's so BS. And if you want to follow the world and all this crazy stuff involving politics, like even my close family members do, uh, go right ahead. But you're wasting your time. Just look up what the Hegelian dialectic is. That's what they're doing to you. They're playing a game. It's never going to get better. You don't have a vote. You don't have choice. Your vote means nothing. You're just being deceived. And all of it is just a way to keep you occupied. Well, I prefer to do it in my own way. I keep myself occupied with wondering whether the earth is a globe or whether it is flat. Yes, I'm not bothering with all of the great conspiracy theories and all the truth movements anymore. No, you go right ahead. You've got me. You finally got me, New World Order. I am just going to spend the rest of my life in my own little world searching for this great deception. Now, that may sound like I'm giving up, but it's not really giving up. It's really, all throughout the years, you know, I'm amazed. I've been a journalist ever since I got out of college. On and off, I've always had different things I've been doing. You know, I get into businesses. I, I like learning about things. And when I was a journalist, when I was young, I used to do stories about people and wanted to do the things they did. I got tired of writing about it. So I tried a lot of different things in my life. Now, that didn't, didn't serve me well financially. And my uncle once told me, he said, Greg, you've got to stay in one place for a while, and you'll become successful. And I said, okay. My favorite uncle, I love him. He's not with us now. But anyway, I didn't take his advice. I should have. And uh, probably should have taken my own advice when I was a kid growing up wanting to be a baseball player. The money these guys make, come on. You don't have to think about anything. All you have to do is hit a ball. It ain't that easy, but uh, it's much better than searching for the truth, let me tell you that. But anyway, so I chose to uh, educate myself. And I didn't realize when I became a journalist how many geniuses I would run into in my life. How many really genius people I would meet that seemed to know everything. They would tell me everything. You know, I really didn't have to ask any questions because throughout the years, it is amazing to me, and it never fails, as I, uh, the more I get into this, the more... I become, the more geniuses I meet. And today, you know, the ironic thing about being a journalist is when you're young, you meet a few geniuses. Then as I get older, I meet hundreds of them now. Everybody's a genius because everybody thinks they know everything because of the Internet. Oh, yeah. That's what really happened. Because you can just click on a button 
and go, okay, Google uh, the Rubric Cube or whatever you want to do. And, and we have all these closet geniuses now that know everything. And it never ends. I don't care what subject you talk about. You can go into politics. Everybody's a genius. Everybody's got their way of changing the world and making it better. Right. I know that. Just talk to people. Oh, yeah. There's one little common thing about geniuses. They're really narrow-minded. I never understood that. A narrow-minded genius. What is that? Well, and I've met so many of them in my life, I don't even know where to start. Everybody is a narrow-minded genius in my world. Oh, yeah. Because how many people really want to open up their mind and just ask questions? Not many. many everybody wants to go to bed with an answer. And unfortunately, you ain't going to get any that quick. There are a few answers. Some of them are based on faith. Some are based on logic, of course. I can say 2 plus 2 equals 4, or I know I can see certain things. I know a tree's a tree. At least that's the name they've given it. I could call it, I guess I could call it an apple. If I grew up thinking a tree was an apple, and that's what they called it, it would be an apple, wouldn't it? But it is an object that I can explain. All right. Now I'm getting off on tangent here. But that's what happens. When you meet all these geniuses, I don't know which one to believe. There's so many of them out there that I can't tell. Now, the point I'm trying to make is, it just amazes me. The more you get into things, the more geniuses in the world you find. I found, you know, when I was young, I only found a couple. Now, there's hundreds of them in my life. Most everybody I talk to is a genius. And they love to put all their stuff out on the Internet, and that is the way it is. Now, I'm not saying that people out there aren't asking questions and looking for the truth. I'm just saying everybody thinks theirs is the model that should stand out in the world as the way to change it, the way to make it better, and I know it, and I'm going to teach you, and I want you to be in my camp exactly what goes on in most cases now there are a few people and i have checked you know in many many i've been in most every one of these truth movements as a journalist and i found a few good people that don't consider themselves geniuses uh but they never seem to get anywhere they always seem to be in the background they never seem to have any say in anything and maybe that's the way it should be because the people that have the biggest say in everything are usually living in this fantasy world, I call it. Now, you can call me crazy, but if you look at every story, and if I look back at every story I've ever done, most of them were based on a fantasy. Most of them were based on the world as we have been told. Most of them are based on experts telling us how to think. And that's exactly... Now, let's just start out in 9-11, when the world... That's my birthday, too, so I like to start out on that day. Uh, that's when I started out on this journey. And I encountered, as a journalist, so many of these geniuses. They still exist today. Oh, yeah, we got geniuses that think they know everything in the Bible. And then we got geniuses that think they know everything in the Constitution. We got geniuses that think they know everything about everything. And they're quick to say things like, Oh, you ought to do it this way. You ought to do it this way. Why are you doing this? You should be doing this because this is this and this is the way it is. And, you know, it really, as a, as a journalist, you begin to get ill because the real question is, no one really knows, you know what, nothing. That's really all it boils down to. We really don't know anything. We think we do, but we don't. And Mark Twain once said it well. He said, never let the truth, or never let facts, stand in the way of a good story. And we live on that notion. We live on that, because that's exactly what we'd, our, our, our life is based on. Oh, yeah. So all these years as a journalist, I could go through, I could probably spend, I could start today, and not stop till probably I keeled over from exhaustion, starting to tell you stories 
And I could probably, in my mind, go back to the first person I interviewed, and it was in, when I was the editor of my student paper, and I interviewed some bigwig rep politician coming down from Springfield, Illinois, to talk to the university, and I was so excited. I mean, I could go through each story, each moment of most every person I've ever interviewed. And through that journey, I've come to a conclusion that... This is a fantasy world. I wrote so many fantasy stories thinking they were true, it's not funny. And how much have you based your life on fantasies? Just think about it. And, you know, if you have questions, just ask me. I get some now. So now I'm doing this story on, you know, I got excited about one thing. Let me explain why I got excited about this story. Because it's taken me away from the Jesuits for a while. Although they're involved in this in the background, I don't have to think about them because I, I was in a, a journalist in Rome and it shattered my belief system when I realized how crooked the Vatican was. Even my own cardinal, or he was uh, Archbishop Marcinkus from Chicago, where I grew up. Yeah, he was head of the Vatican Bank. Think I got a buck out of it? No. Are you kidding me? Heck no, I'm not in the club. But those guys were bilking people out of billions with the mafia, the Vatican, saying, you know, and I remember his great statement, you can't run a church on Hail Marys. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? Well, I could go on and on this whole show about Cardinal Marchinkus or Archbishop Marchinkus, but when I learned about that Jesuit story, I had to get to the bottom of it, and I tell you what I did. And, you know, yesterday, I get so many emails, because I'm talking about the earth is not a globe anymore. It's not, it's a circle surrounded and i'm going to explain to you uh why i'm going to prove that to you how i'm going to do it i'm not going to do it through you know uh mirrors and phony cmi images like nasa does proving to you that the earth is a globe and you're going to believe that just like you're going to believe we went to pluto uh and all those phony pictures they're telling us today they're always coming up with something new did you realize that in 1930 the dog Pluto in Disney, and we just happened to discover the planet Pluto then, too. Isn't that interesting? It's not a planet. Some, it's a, some little star out there. But anyway, all these geniuses now, today, think they know everything. Oh, first I run into the geniuses in the Bible. It's not a circle. It is a globe. Look at these bi biblical statements. And you know what? None of them ever say the word globe. But they're genius. They have an idea. That's the way they want to go. That's fine with me. Fine with me. Then we got geniuses in other camps that go, Oh no. It's, a, it's this. It's that. It's this. It's that. Who knows what's up there? Oh, we got satellites. Because you got dish satellite TV. So there has to be satellites. There are no satellites. I will bet my life on it there's not one satellite flying up there. And I'll bet my life on it this is not a globe. Okay. Why would I bet my life on it? Well, I'm not worth anything. Right? According to New World Order, my life ain't worth nothing. I'm not Donald Trump. I don't have a 757 jet. So I can bet my life on it. What do I got to lose? <laughs> right? Now, you think Donald Trump's going to bet his life on it? Hell no. He's got to play the fantasy game. Because he's got too much invested in it. And he's too good. You know, he's got to have gold-plated seatbelts to put around that fat stomach of his. That's right. That's why he's not going to He's not gonna ever... You know, I could ask him. i say, Donald, i got to prove that the earth is a globe. Could you help me? Donald Trump, can you help me? I want to prove that it's not a globe. And here's how we're going to do it. you got enough money. you got more airplanes than Carter has pills. Now, Donald, here's my point. Uh, I think the South Pole does not exist. Now, we can prove that with your airplane, but you don't want to, you got enough money to pay for the gas. Well, why don't we do, why don't you buy me, uh, uh, just get me a ship just like Captain Cook had in the 17th. We'll do, a, we'll figure out exactly what his ship, because it was strong enough to, it was wood too, it wasn't fiberglass. And uh, wood and salt water get along, by the way. Uh, let's build a boat, let's go do it. And because I don't think the South Pole exists at all. And listen, if it does, if this is a globe, you know what, I'll vote for you. How's that? I'll make a bet with you. 
Now, let's go on. Now, he's a genius. He's one of these geniuses. Uh, I've met so many pastor, you know, people in the uh, ecumenical movement and people even outside of the ecumenical movement who think they know everything about uh, everything. It's incredible. I even know somebody who says, the sun has to be, it has to be a globe because I just saw the sun set the other day. Well, I'm going to deal with that issue in a minute. And I'm not a know-it-all because I took it into account and I said, it can't be a globe. If, you know, just think about this for a minute. All right, let's get to the next point. Uh, Mr. Trump, get me a ship. I've got one now. I don't know if it's strong enough to make it, but I'm working on it. I, I set out the other, you know, when I did part one and two of this, part 12 we're on, uh, I was on my way to this ice wall. Let me tell you why, how you can get there, okay? And let me explain this to you. Now, I don't think, Mr. Trump, that the uh, South Pole exists at all. In our, Antarctica is instead a gigantic ice wall extending the circumference of the Earth, holding in the oceans, like a giant bowl or a World Cup. As strange as this concept may sound to you, uh, if you set a bearing due south, from any point on the Earth, inevitably, uh, at or before 70 degrees southern latitude, you will find yourself face to face with an enormous ice wall, towering hundreds to 300 feet in the air, extending to the east and west the entire circumference of this circle Earth, as depicted on your United Nations flag. Uh, and let's see what, uh, this, this guy said something interesting, Mr. Gre General Greeley, uh, in, uh, 1894 said this, the ice barrier so frequently referred to in accounts of the Antarctic regions is the forefront of the enormous glacier covering or ice cap, which accumulating in vast undulated fields from the heavy snowfall and ultimately attaining hundreds, if not thousands of feet in thickness, creeps from the continent of Antarctica into the polar sea. The ice barrier, yet a port, a part of the parent ice cap, presents itself to the navigator who has boldness enough to approach its fearful front as a solid perpendicular marble-like ice ranging from 1,000 to 2,000 feet in thickness, of which 100 or 200 feet rises above and from 800 to 1,800 feet sinks below the levels of the sea. And this travels all, if you, like Captain Cook did, and other explorers before Nassau, uh, they went all the way around for three years. Couldn't find an opening. It wasn't just a little spot on the bottom of a ball. Now, what, uh, what else can you show here? What did uh, Samuel Raw, his name is Robotham, in the Zed he wrote something very interesting called the Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe. He said, it has been demonstrated that the Earth is a plane, the surface center of which is immediately underneath the star called Polaris, and the extremities of which bounded by a vast region of ice and water and irregular masses of land. The whole terminates in fog and darkness where snow and driving hail, piercing steet and uh, uh, sleet and boisterous winds, howling storms, madly mounting waves, and clashing icebergs are almost constant. Now, here's a... I'd like to say this to the powers that be. I'm not in their club. And most of you that listen to this show aren't either. Maybe some of you uh, perpetrators, uh, somebody... My one email are all calls them perps. Burps, I call them. All you government burps. That probably, some of you listen to the show, you're probably assigned to it or something, I don't know. Good luck. Uh, I wouldn't want to be assigned to listening to my show, I'll tell you that right now. It'd drive me crazy. Thank God I don't have to listen to it and I just have to tell, talk about it. <laughs> Imagine if I had to listen to myself. It'd be crazy. Uh, but, what I'm getting at uh, is... I'll make a deal with all you people. With all your money, NASA, and everything that Donald Trump and all you politicians out there, Hillary,
Clinton, and you know, she grew up. It's interesting. It ain't in the water. Remember, you say, oh, it must be in the water. Hillary Clinton grew up in my neighborhood in Park Ridge, Illinois. I was right near her in Niles, and I went to Notre Dame High School. She grew up, and she's, almost, she's a bit older, not much older than me, but she's older than me. She grew up in the same, she went to a public school there. So, you know, how can two people turn out so differently from the same upbringing? Well, I don't know. You know, maybe it's the parents. My dad, and I don't know what her dad was like. But mine wasn't a member of the, I wasn't a Mason or anything. He was just a common, everyday, average Joe. And look what she turned out to be. Nothing more than a witch. And she's going to run for president of this global fascist dictatorship they're creating. And getting us to believe that it's a democracy. And then go back to the founding fathers. Oh, my God. I, I hear that one more time, and I'm going to throw up. Back to the found. I don't want to go back to the founding fathers. They were just as bad as the whatever we got today. Probably worse, because they set it all up. <laughs> Oh, boy, the things we've believed in our lives. But you can't blame everybody. We still got a whole bunch of geniuses out there. And it's great. That's why I keep doing this. Because I want people to, to bestow upon me all of their knowledge, their infinite wisdom. And I don't care what you believe. I really don't. You can go on believing whatever you believe. It's fine with me. Whether you're a government perp, or whether you're a truth teller, or whether you found God through the Bible, or whether you found it through the Koran, or whatever. Go on. It's not my business. My business is simple. I started to ask questions when I was a journalist, and I'm still doing it, but I'm just having fun now. See, in the later years of your life, depending on your financial success, I guess, you can have some fun in life. So... You know, here's what people normally do, don't they? When they retire or get older, they uh, travel the world. Oh, yeah, they save up money, then they take these cruises, you know. But you can't cruise. I want to see somebody cruise or take an airplane and go over Antarctica. You can't do it because it doesn't exist, and they protect it with their Antarctic Treaty. So what I'm doing is basically my own little vacation. I'm retiring to go find this great ice wall. Now, why can't I do that? And why can't I use my radio show to tell you about it? After all these years, after all these years of dedicating my time to getting at the, the evil Jesuit order, in fact, somebody sent me something that was quite interesting. It's the prayer to stop Jesuit witchcraft. This long thing. I remember getting it like 10 years ago. And somebody sent it to me again. And you know what, I would read it, but I'm tired, you know, I've already been through that. I know what they're all about. Some of you know what they're all about, too. But shouldn't I have the right to retire in peace myself? And I'm going to do it my own way. By showing you that Nassau has taken you like a little puppet doll and ingrained in your mind, just like the Pope is ingrained in your mind, that he's the vicar of Christ, that the earth is a globe. And I'm going to have a good time on my boat, traveling the world, showing it to you. Now, what's wrong with that? I'll be back in three minutes. We're going to explain how we're going to do it. And also, I want to talk about a few things that people, some emails and some comments people made about my show. Back in three minutes. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. 
If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased. It has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Okay, we're back on the Investigative Journal on this uh, July 29th, 2015 day on our calendar. And I'm uh, in search of the Great Ice Wall, Part 12. And here's here we go. Let's get right to this. I want to finish up this Antarctica thing. That it does not. There's a good possibility, a good probability. Uh, I guess if I, you know, I have a legal law degree, which I like to use to tell people that I'm a genius as well as you, uh, just like you. So I'm a genius too, because uh, there's so many I meet out there. Everybody that I talk to apparently believes they're a genius when it comes to these subjects that I deal with. Um, so. I like to stick it in your face, too. Uh, Greg is a JD, yes. And I did put JA behind my name for occasional periods of time, and you can decide what that means. But anyway, Antarctica, there's a good possibility. It's, and if I was in a court of law, I probably could do it. Because uh, then, you know, if I was a bigwig, I could probably get you to believe me. If I worked for NASA, you'd believe me. I could show you some stupid picture, and you'd believe me. Just like they show you the stupid picture of the globe, you be- they- you'd believe me. But here you go. Antarctica, I don't think, is a tiny little ice continent like they tell us. Uh, like it's always on the underside of the earth. Uh, take a balloon and put a uh, piece of paper on the bottom of a balloon without you know, putting any stick on it. It doesn't stick. It falls, it falls to the ground. Now, it shouldn't if gravity exists, but then again, gravity doesn't exist. Now, so I don't think it's this little area on the underside of this globe, uh, but quite to the uh, opposite. Antarctica, I think, literally surrounds us 360 degrees. It encircles everything that we know is our Earth. And how many of us have got out of this fishbowl, so to speak? None of us. You ever see that movie Truman? Go look at it. All you know-it-alls. And tell me they ain't telling you something there. But, you know, most people, what they do is they go, okay, I'm going to pick and choose what fantasy I want to believe in today and what reality I want to make real. And that's really what people do. But just take the whole, you know, just... Why don't you think one day in your life, everything is a deception, including what you're walking on today, this earth. Think that way once. Just like you came, you know, you people, you Bible believers out there, who came to the conclusion that uh, everybody that is not 
a Bible believer is not going to heaven or something. Okay. Or some, you know, everybody that believes in the Bible had to realize the Vatican is the Antichrist. So you, you came to that, you can come to this conclusion too. It's not that far-fetched. The most commonly asked questions and the greatest mysteries, yeah, yet to be solved. Now, how does this Antarctic ice extend outwards? I'm not saying I know. Is there a limit to it? What lies beyond? Or is it just snow and ice forever? But thanks to the UN treaties, constant military surveillance, your friendly American democracy, the North Pole and Antarctica remain cloaked in government secrecy, both purported no-fly zones, no-sail zones, with several reports of civilian pilots and captains being (laughs) shooed away, escorted, even told under the threat of violence to get the hell out of this area. It's not for you to research. But we choose to give them billions of dollars to give us fake computer-generated images of what is supposedly in space, and that's to keep you away from what's on the sides of this This little plane we live in. Now, the question is, how far does the ice extend? And what lies beyond that wall? Now, as other explorers before Nassau came about, circumnavigated around this circle, around this ice for three years and could not find an opening. And I say, "You you can take a ship if we, you know, and go in any direction... And you will end up at the ice wall. That's what we're trying to show you. That's what my retirement is all about. It's a world cruise. I'm taking the ultimate cruise. Everywhere. I can go anywhere I want. But I ain't going, I'll tell you what. There's no way out of this one. Oh, you can't uh, take a spaceship and go into space like they tell you. That's all computer-generated image, thanks to Stanley Kubrick, Walt Disney, and the rest of these guys. I don't know if Kubrick was going to ever tell the truth about what he did, but his life's interesting to look at. Okay. So, you know, before you reach that Antarctic ice, so navigating is very difficult. You got those southern. I mean, it's incredible what you'll find. That's. I mean, it's the. It's very bad conditions, uh, and uh, Vasco da Gama, an early 16th century Portuguese explorer of the South Seas, wrote this: "The waves rise like mountains in height. Ships are heaved up to the clouds and apparently precipitated by circling whirlpools to the bed of the ocean. The winds are." piercing cold and so boisterous that the pilot's voice can seldom be heard whilst the dismal and almost continental darkness adds greater to the danger. So, seven, remember I told you about Captain Cook in 1773? He became the first modern explorer known to have breached the Antarctic Circle and reached this ice barrier. He wrote about it. During three voyages lasting three years and eight days, he sailed more than 60,000 miles in a circumference coastline, never once finding an inlet or path through or beyond the massive glacier wall. Cook wrote, The ice extended east and west far beyond the reach of our sight, while the southern half of the horizon was illuminated by rays of light which were reflected from the ice to a considerable height. It was indeed my opinion that this ice extends quite to the pole, or perhaps joins some land to which it has been fixed since creation. Amazing, huh? Now, on October 5th, we went over this once before. On October 5th, 1839, another explorer named James Clark Ross began a series of Antarctic voyages lasting a total of four years and five months. How come we don't read about this stuff in the history books? They they want to whitewash it. They don't want you to start researching what this really looks like. Now, Ross and his crew sailed two heavily armored warships thousands of miles, losing many men from hurricanes and icebergs, looking for an entry point beyond the southern glacier wall. Upon first confronting the massive barrier, Ross wrote, listen to what he wrote, 
Extending from its eastern extreme point as far as the eye could discern to the eastward, it presented an extraordinary appearance, gradually increasing in height. As we got nearer to it, it and proving at length to be a perpendicular cliff of ice, between 150 to 200 feet above the level of the sea, perfectly flat and level at the top, and without any fissures or any significant hills or mountains on its even seaward face, we might well equal chance of success try to sail through the cliffs of Dover as to penetrate such a mass. Yet, but we cannot circumnavigate the south easily enough. It's often uh, said by those who didn't know, this is uh, William Carpenter, a hundred proofs that the world is not a globe, get his book. Uh, the British ship Challenger recently completed the circuit of Southern Region indirectly, to be sure, but she was three years about it and traversed nearly 69,000 miles, stretched long enough to have taken her six times around on, the glo- on a globular hypothesis. So, there's a lot more to talk about. You can go and uh, look it up yourself. Uh, how much time do I got left here? I got enough time here to do a few more things. So, my little vacation period is going to be a glow as a, a cruise. I'm just taking a cruise like you guys, no different. But let's let's deal with a few things here today. Uh, so I'm a little bit skeptical about this Antarctic Treaty. You ought to look into it. Why are we protecting that so much? When, you know, supposedly NASA is an open book when we talk about they're showing us Pluto and all this crap, but they won't even let us uh, circumnavigate our own Earth. They won't even let us travel certain places here. That's kind of, kind of weird, doesn't it? And another thing, you know what opened my mind? It's nice to scuba dive a lot. We haven't even figured out what's under the ocean. We spend all this money creating these fantasies up in space when we don't even know what's down below as well. Interesting. It's all a ruse, let me tell you. I'm convinced of it. And uh, nobody's going to tell me otherwise because I want to be a genius just like you guys. Okay. Now, some people tell me, let's deal with this issue. And I'm going to have to call upon a couple people here that know more about this than me. I just use my, uh, my eyes. But, some, uh, somebody told me the other day that I can't buy the, I, the, the sun. I saw it set the other day, and it's got to be a globe. can't be flat. Well, when I see it, I look at it differently. Now, we have to think of this. We don't have infinite vision. If we did, and plus, just use a pair of binoculars, and let me tell you something. The horizon, or that the... the the, the uh, where that sun is setting and where the, the number of miles that is there should be you shouldn't even see it because of you know what's called the curvature but don't let math stand in the way of what you think is correct well, I'm using math to show you it's impossible now the sun and moon I think revolve around the earth and I think uh, everybody would uh, revolve around. Now, that could be on top of us once every 24 hours. Now, would anybody disagree with that? Illuminating, I think, like spotlights, the areas over which they pass. Now, a couple people did some research on this, and I'm going to pull some of their words out. Now, the annual journey that the sun makes is from the tropic to the trop, uh, from the tropic to tropic, solstice to solstice, and that's what determines the length and character of our days, nights, and seasons. I, I tell you, if you look at the stats and the facts, it, it can't be a globe if you start thinking in these terms. This is why the equatorial regions experience almost year-round summer and heat, while uh, higher latitudes, north and especially south, experience more distant distinct seasons and harsh winters. The heliocentric model claims seasons changed based on the ball Earth's alleged axial tilt and elliptical orbit around the sun. Now, these words are coming from somebody that's written on this and wrote a book on it. Now, some people say he's a government perpetrator. Some people say he's not. His name's Dubai. Dubai. And I'm using this because he gives a good... I'm not 
this smart. I'm not this much of a genius, but I do know this. They, I do understand the law of, which is really the key to this whole story, to get to the point. Uh, I'm, I'm discussing uh, why, when you see that sun go down, that it can't be a ball. Now, some people say it's got to be a ball, but I'm talking about the law of perspective is really the key here. You got a perspective. You can, and we'll get into this in a minute. And it's explained quite well. Dubai does it quite well. And uh, I think it's good for you to listen. So here's uh, more of what he said, just to explain this. And I basically look at it differently. I just look at that uh, horizon and I go, well, look at the distance. I measure the distance. Now, I should not be able to see that because of the curvature that they tell me. So I'm using math, and I use a sextant, and that tells me. So all these words here uh, kind of uh, explain it differently. I use a very simple method. But people don't like simplicity. Uh, they're going to say, oh, that's wrong, because they want to believe in this curvature. I don't know why. I think it's they, you know, I don't know. Why? Maybe they were playing with, uh, you know, everything you get of baseballs when they were young. So maybe I should be, you know, me wanting to be a baseball player, I should believe the earth is round. Uh, but anyway, the heliocentric model, okay, Mr. Dubai is telling us this, claims seasons change based on the ball Earth's alleged axial tilt and the elliptical orbit around the sun. Their flawed current model even places us closest to the sun at 91.400 thousand miles away in January when it's actually winter and farthest from the sun 94.500 thousand miles away in July when it's actually summer throughout much of the Earth. They say due to the ball's Earth's tilt, different places receive different amounts of direct sunlight and that is what produces the seasonal and temperature changes. This makes little sense, though, he says. However, because if the sun's heat travels over 90 million miles to reach the ball Earth, how could a slight tilt, a few thousand miles maximum, negate the sun's 90 million mile journey, giving us simultaneous tropical summers and Arctic winters? And I want to say it never changes. Everything seems the same to me every year. Now, here's a little quote from Thomas Winship from the, a book called Zetetic Cos, uh, Cosmology, page 124-125. The Earth is a stretched-out structure which diverges from the central north in all directions towards the south. The equator being... Now, this, this kind of uh, will give you some ideas that maybe the globe isn't what we're talking about here. The equator being midway between the north center and southern circumference divides the course of the sun into north and southern uh, declination. The longest circle around the world which the sun makes is when it has reached its greatest southern uh, point. Gradually pointing northwards, the circle is contracted. In about three months, about the southern extremity of its path has been reached. The sun makes a circle around the equator, still pursuing a uh, northerly course as it goes around and ar around and above the world, in, a, in another three months, the greatest northern declination is reached. When the sun again begins to go, n go towards the south, in north lesser altitude at noon and sets earlier. In northern latitudes during the southern summer, say from September to December, the sun rises later each day, is lower at noon and sets earlier. Now, if this goes out and it's probably complicated, but let's look at it this way. Let me check the time here. Okay, we've got about six minutes. The sun and moon spotlights, that's what I like to call them, they're spotlights up there, are perpetually hovering over and parallel to the surface of the Earth. From our vantage point, due to the law of perspective, the day-night luminaries appear to rise up the eastern horizon, curve peaking high overhead, and then sink below the western horizon. They do not escape to the underside of the flat earth, as one might imagine, but rather rotate concentric clockwise circles around the circumference from tropic to tropic. 
the appearance of rising, peaking, and setting is due to the common law of perspective, where tall objects appear high overhead when nearby, but at a distance gradually lower towards the vanishing point. And that isn't the horizon, because that distance that you're looking at is much greater, and you shouldn't even see it. The horizon, there's a curvature they tell us on a globe, and you shouldn't see anything at that distance. Now, here's what Samuel Rothbottom said in Earth Not a Globe, second edition. Although the sun is at all times above and parallel to the Earth's surface, it appears to ascend the firmament from morning until noon and descend and sink below the horizon in evening. That arises from a simple and everywhere visible law of perspective. A flock of birds, when passing over a flat or marshy country, always appears to descend as it recedes. And if the flock is extensive, the first bird appears lower, or nearer to the horizon than the last. The farthest light in a row of lamps appears the lowest, although each one has the same altitude. Bearing these phenomena in mind, it will easily be seen how the sun, although always parallel to the surface of the earth, must appear to ascend in a, when approaching, and descend when leaving the meridian or noonday position. Now put that in your hat and smoke it, Nassau. Or your pipe. <laughs> put that in your hat and smoke it. <laughs> uh, okay. Now what did he, he continue to say? What can be more common than the observation that standing at the end of a long row of lampposts? Do that. Those nearest to us seem to be the highest, don't they? and those farthest away the lowest. Well, and, and the point is, they're all even. There are never, there is no, there is no, you can prove this, no curvature. But they appear because of your eye. You don't have infinite eyes. God didn't give you eyes that could see forever. And Nassau uses that to trick you. That's why you people that think when the sun sets it goes around a ball, you're, you really got to really think a little more and not become a genius. Just you answer, ask some questions. Think differently. Don't criticize before you know what you're talking about. It's an ordinary effect of perspective for an object to appear lower and lower as the observer goes farther and farther away from it. Let anyone try the experiment of looking at a lighthouse church spire and all you people out there who believe in the bible you're going to look at a lot of church spires but look at it from this perspective monument gas lamp or other elevated objects from a distance of only a few yards and notice the angle at which it's observed i'm going farther away the angle under which it is seen will diminish and the object will appear lower and lower as the distance of the observer increases until, at a certain point, the line of sight to the object and the apparently uprising surface of the earth upon over which it stands will converge to the angle which constitute the vanishing point or the horizon, which I claim to be a complete flat horizon. And we can prove that with a sextant. We can prove it through experiments. We know there should be a curvature at four miles and you should see certain things, but you don't. The line of sight of the object the apparently uprising surface of the earth upon over which it stands will converge in the angle which constitutes the vanishing point of the horizon beyond which it will be invisible. Yes, you do not have infinite sight. Now, so, the next time you're looking at the supposed sunset, I recommend you also consider this, the distance. And then consider if you're, I like to do this when I'm on the ocean, I see all these light rays coming right to my feet. That would be impossible on a globe Earth. I don't care about the vanishing points or the anything. I just know that if the curvature is there and that distance to where I see that ball, and also the size of it will show you something different, uh, it can't be a globe. Just like Antarctica can't be on the on the bottom of the ball, this little surface there. Now, there's a couple other things you can do. We don't have time today, but I hope uh, 
that answers a few questions from people that were interested. And uh, that's interesting. Uh, and I hope that, uh, you know, we can continue to go on my retired vacation here, my travels, just as anyone else that deserves to do that. And when they get in their older years, uh, take their voyages, take their cruises. Uh, that's all I'm doing. And in the process, uh, getting out of this fantasy world that we live in, you know, it's so nice sometimes. And uh, But I will come back to some of the stories that are important to me, and that's, of course, uh, the Vatican, the which is, you know, if some people ask me, who's the anti, and you know, we hear that word antichrist all the time, I keep telling them. It's been here for years. It's always been here. It's the Vatican institution. Uh, and if you don't believe that, I don't care. You have your thoughts, too. There's so many different people, thoughts, I can't, I can't uh, control them all, and I don't want to. But anyway, that'll give you something to think about today. For all of you geniuses out there, including myself, let's have a good evening and good night.